so going into 99, there was a lot of uh, anxiety. And that's when, you know, we actually made the decision. We really need to pull back and get our business sorted out before we make another record. There's no way we're going to let this happen to us again. We'd be fools to put ourselves in that same situation where, you know, you bleed to make a record and to only to have it thrown in the garbage. So we kind of hit pause. Again, um, it, it's a business. It's a business. You tour a lot and you're not home a lot and you, you're together with these guys that become your family. We went through a period of weirdness and then we regrouped. We got a call. Promoters in the States want you guys uh, to come do some shows. You know, there's an offer for, to do this tour. It was going to be like January, February of 2000. We would go out and do a headline run. And we were kind of like, why? The record's been dead for a year and a half at this point. Mike said, no, there really seems to be interest, you know, in the band. You've been away for a little while. <laughs> so we decided to do it. And pretty much the whole run sold out. We get another call asking us to come out on this Maximum Rock Tour with Motley Crue and Megadeth, and we would be the opener. And we looked at it as, hey, what a great you know, way for the band to go out, play bigger venues, play to bigger crowds, be out there with our buddies in Megadeth, and make a little bit of money, because that certainly wasn't happening so much around that time. Honestly, that right there was the beginning of the turnaround uh, for Anthrax. Yeah, I, I got a call. Hey, uh, John Carpenter is looking for a metal band to score some scenes in his upcoming movie. Wants to know if you'd be interested in going over to the studio. I was already out the door. The phone was like literally dropping in the air in slow motion. And I'm like, Bzz. I walk in and, and uh, yeah, it's John Carpenter sitting in the control room. He's smoking a cigarette. He's got a cup of coffee and then, hey, nice to meet you. I'm, and I'm just trying to be cool. All stronger on the well, I just felt the movie needed that. They uh, they were just a great band, and they could did some great music. So that's where we started. Just telling me, like, I'm just I want something really hard. And you know, if you're familiar with my work, I'm like, I'm very familiar with your work, John. Because the thing is, my favorite movie of all time, besides Jaws. Because and I just I really hear like a metal band doing this. Do you think you guys would be into it? I'm like. Well, yes, we're into it. We're in. We're in. Don't don't call anyone else. Like I couldn't get Charlie on the phone fast enough. Like I just sat with John Carver. Excitement on the phone. I mean, it was just like, what? Are you kidding me? When? Let's go. Can't wait. Boom! I think I booked the ticket right there and then, and just we were out there and we were doing it. I received a very excited call from Charlie. You're not gonna believe this. We just got offered a John Carpenter movie. I'm like. What? Well, yeah, we're doing a soundtrack. And I was like, <laughs> wow, congratulations, buddy. He was like, fuck that, you're coming with us. And I was like, <laughs> wow. First day, we get in there, we start getting some tones together. We start talking about what he's looking for. He plays us some reference tracks that he's kind of modeling these songs after. And then we just go for it. We had all our gear set up in the room. Each one of us had a little TV monitor. You know, so we'd be able to watch the picture because we were literally going to write and play to picture, which is something we had never done before. I had one by the drums. The other guys had monitors out there. He would play us a scene. It would inspire us to write a song around it. It was fun for us to be a part of that and um, live that side of it. You know what I mean? And we, we never really did anything like that. We were just going in the studio and jamming all that stuff. But this was specific. And I, I, like, I like that whole part of it. All I kept thinking about was, which day am I going to bring out all this memorabilia that I wanted to sign for me? So I had to play that one right. I was in awe. The whole time with John Carpenter, I was in awe. Just to watch how he worked, because it, it, it's simplistic. Everything he does is, is really, he, it's a matter of fact. In the studio, I was just wanted to see his process and what, how he thought. He was behind the glass the whole time, you know. Had the movie playing, we had to sync up all of our music to to things happening, you know, like people getting their heads cut off. He goes, I'll just leave you guys alone to do your thing. And we're like, well, but please, we, you know, give us as much direction as you can. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, you know, don't worry. I'll tell you where I want things. I was just amazed at how he would use our music and put that to film. 
I didn't know how that was going to happen. I know we could write heavy music. I wasn't worried about that. But what he saw, what parts, and then when you see the film, it's awesome the way he used it, you know? One of my favorite scenes was one called Pam Greer's Head. And it was the scene where Pam Greer's head is on a stake. And when they revealed the shot, John wanted us to hit it in a certain way. We would come up with a riff and we'd start jamming on a riff. What do you think of that, John? And he'd be like, that sounds great, you know? How about, can you, can you maybe start it a little bit slower, then bring the tempo up, and then maybe, you know, a dip here, and then maybe then come, you know, and he's like, all right, I want like a build, a build, a build, kind of a build, and then when we get to the decat, I want a big, you know, something big crescendo. We're gonna build to that moment, and then it's gotta come in super heavy. It was just incredible. I mean, it's John Carpenter, you know, like, <laughs> Wow. We had a great, great re working relationship. I had a great time with them. There's only one thing I regret. There's one piece of music I should have made them do faster. I wish John would have said it. I, I'm, I'm sure we could have accommodated him. I'm not really worried, you know, that we can keep up with speed. I don't remember anything like that about playing something faster. Because for me, hey, I'll play it faster. That's, that's easy, you know. But now I'm thinking, I don't remember that. Just an easy working relationship. And the, the terms of talking, I, it was this, is this good? What do you think about this? Should we do it this way? It was great stuff. Shit, it's John Carpenter. I would have done whatever he wanted with me. We were in the studio and we were working, but we were working. So you, you can go back and forth a little bit, but it was mainly about the project. It was so hard sometimes for me to get out of my own way and like just be able to do the work, do the thing that we're supposed to do because I'm just sitting there thinking about what questions am I going to ask him about, you know, the thing that I haven't already asked. Or Because he would, he was very happy to entertain us once we would be done, like, such, like we'd work for hours and then he'd be like, all right, let's 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 take five, whatever. And we would sit and have coffee and we would just sit there and interview him, basically uh, interviewing John Carpenter for Fangoria by, by Anthrax, you know. Um, and he would sit there and answer all our questions and it was, it was just great. And we got to do that for a whole week, like a solid seven days. The last day, I finally bring out all the memorabilia for him to sign, and he was so, so amazing. Uh, he signed everything, and we talked a lot about the movies. I thought he was, he was a lot of fun. He was very, you know, inspirational, like, go for it, go for it. He just kept, yeah, give me more of that. Okay, when I was playing the bass, was, give me more of that, you know, he's like that. And I, I love that, so he, he was encouraging. He, he wrote me a great, a signed picture, great bass, so I was really happy. We'll do it again, why don't we just, we should put this, call, call John back up, we're ready to do another film immediately, because I'd love to do anything with him again. The only thing that happened, our guitar player at the time, Paul Crook, said something about there was a mistake in his, uh, in the Halloween soundtrack and theme, and Paul said something about you left it in, that was so great that you left in the mistake. And Carpenter's just, you know, he's just sitting there smoking a cigarette and he just literally feels the temperature of the room drop. And he's like, he just silently like looks at Paul. He's like, what mistake? It was silence. <laughs> like, and we're waiting for like him to laugh or something. It's like, like what the king laughs and then it's okay for us to laugh. Like, and it's just silent and everyone's frozen. John doesn't laugh. I don't think Carpenter spoke to Paul the rest of the time. <laughs> Everyone like kind of left the room at some point and we were like, dude, why would you say, what the, why would you say like, and Paul's like, well, because there is, there's a, and we're like, dude, what the fuck? Like, I think Carpenter may have at some point later that day made a mention of like, we were all out in the room and we're working on one of the scenes and he's like, yeah, it's, you know, you guys, you make it so easy for me to do this. You're making my job so easy, except for that guy. And he kind of had a smile on his face when he said it. <laughs> he was fine with her. He was fine with the, he was fine with the rest of us. <laughs> they were really nice, really nice guys. I just really enjoyed him. And we just had a good time. I, I was pretty tired by that point, you know, making the movie and all uh, on and on and on. So I was, I was pooped and they, they picked up the reins and drove the sleigh. Incredible experience. Definitely a highlight of my entire life. He was very much in the band. He plays guitar on the record. 
He was touring in the band. He was up there sweating and banging his head and bleeding and tearing up his fingers and working as hard as every uh, any one of us. He was very much one fifth of, of that. The band was making no money at that point in time, right? So it was actually better for him to not, if he was a member of the band, he would have made zero. <laughs> I wanted more than they were willing to give. That is it, business. No hard feelings. I love the guys. At that time, it, you know, it was uh, definitely slim pickings. I give it up for Paul for being there for us and for working so hard, you know, for us uh, uh, at that time. The lead guitar player slot in Anthrax was just like this weird, couldn't really, you couldn't really tell what the hell was going on, you know? Um, so I guess for me, you know, I interpreted that as maybe there's an opening here, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I went after it. 99 anthrax was basically in the wind 2000 we did the the run in january february which was great we did the maximum rock tour that summer then we got rob in the band he was brought up by another friend of ours and um i remember hanging out with rob and one of the first times i met with rob we went to the this diner where i used to live like on a hill in like Westchester Yonkers and there was this diner that I'd always go to um, and we met at this diner and it was like one o'clock two o'clock in the afternoon and I remember I was like ordering breakfast and Rob ordered duck and I was just like seriously you could get duck <laughs> but that was Rob in a nutshell you know just always thinking somewhere else I have to say this I love Rob Caggiano, great player, great producer, all of the above, great friend of mine is Paisan, but he likes to eat. There were times where we're recording a track, specifically, it could be anything, bass track, guitar track, and, and you're halfway through it and you go, you guys hungry? You know, you always come up, you guys hungry? And then we have to take two, at least two hours to fucking eat something. And that would get the vibe, it's like, dude, I'm not gonna, no, I wanna finish this fucking track and then we'll eat. Rob, well, we just felt we needed more Italian and more Italians in the band, so. <laughs> and the guys in Volby could tell you this too, because he is a true character. It's just the, the way, um, he's, he's the Mr. Magoo of metal. And if you ever watch the Mr. Magoo cartoons, you know, he'd be walking across the roof of a building and about to step off the ledge, and then the girder comes and he walks on the girder and he's about to walk off a girder and then a bird, you know. He always miraculously comes through. We're walking through an airport, I think like maybe in Mexico City or something and he buys this really expensive bottle of tequila. We get on our flight to wherever we're going, I think somewhere in South America. We're off the plane, we come through customs, we've got our bags, and he realizes, I left the bottle above, in the bin above my seat. I'm like, oh my God, like, how could you do that? He's like, I'm going back to get it. I'm like, how you, we're out of the airport. You can't get through back, through security, through the airport, down the jetway into the plane. It's been like an hour. I'm getting that bottle, right? He takes off. Wait for me. Don't leave me here, right? He takes off. We're like, he's nuts. He's never going to get that bottle of tequila back. It's impossible. He comes walking back through. He's got the bottle. He's one of those uh, brothers, you know, brothers that uh, you'll, you'll always hang with. He's, he's just a ball to hang with. I love working with Rob Caggiano. Rob has a certain style to his playing that it's kind of, it doesn't go with his character at all. Like when he plays, it's a different thing that comes out of him. Once we got Rob in the band, we had come back together. We weren't, we weren't apart anymore. When that term, the big four was originally coined, and I, that's, that was my religion back then, you know, as a kid. I just worship those those bands, you know. And of course, you know, Anthrax being the uh, the New York band, um, obviously from New York, you know, they always had a bit of a different spin on stuff, you know, with, with the riffs and the way Scott played the guitar, and you know, there was a, a different type of uh, how do I explain it? Different type of regression to the way those guys play. We're from New York. Everybody else is trying to act like they're from New York. The West Coast is trying to. It is trying to, you know, get the New York swagger. That's what the L.A. guys are trying to be. 
that's a, they're just the LA guys and West Coast guys are dude, dude. I mean, that is at their core. That is who they are. We are fuck. New York is what the fuck, and they're like, dude, what's up? You know, I mean, and, and all of their behaviors are trying to emulate the swagger that New Yorkers have, and Anthrax embodies that genuine swagger. D. Snyder, a fucking animal. Uh, a New Yorker, you know what I mean? He didn't take shit from anybody. And just like I said, their work ethic, Twisted Sister worked hard. And if they taught us anything, it's like, you got to get out there. We're New York bands. We're New York guys. Eddie Trunk had this idea to do a benefit for the New York City Widows and Orphans Fund for the New York City Police Fire Department and emergency services workers who died 9-11. On 9-11. It was a very emotional time. So if you're from New York and you live through 9-11, that's the only way I can explain this to you, you still get chills. It still freaks you out. You still can't talk about it. Yeah, that New York Steel show, man, it, it's hard to put it into words, you know, the heaviness of that night. The, I don't mean musically heavy. It's us talking about the intensity of the, of the, uh, the event and when people in Texas are wearing New York strong shirts. Well, imagine what it felt like when you were in New York shortly after 9-11. I mean, that show happened not too long after, and it was strictly for the families of the first responders, and the money was going directly to them. We were at, all at a loss. Everybody felt like, what can I do? And it was JJ who picked up the phone and said, I want to do something, and the only thing I know how to do is play rock and roll. What do you think about doing a, a charity show? Eddie Trunk's trying to put something together. And, uh, and I was just like, Fuck yeah. I mean, that's a reason to get together. You know, Eddie, Eddie called us and asked us, do we, of course we want to be involved. Of course. Anthrax overkill. It was kind of like a, a Lamore reunion is really, really what it truly was. Meantime, meanwhile, back at the ranch, Anthrax is suffering through this bizarro time because of the name of their group, um, because Anthrax scares and is all this paranoia and terrorism and all this stuff. For the first time in our career, we realized we had only been leasing our name. The, the post 9-11 world and everything everyone had just been through, um, and people want to talk to us about the name of our band, the CNN ticker thing. CNN has the, the ticker at the bottom of the screen. I'm sitting there watching CNN, and across the bottom of the screen, it says heavy metal band Anthrax to change name to Basket Full of Puppies. We are not that. We have nothing to do with any of that anthrax we are this we are something that brings happiness and joy we entertain people that's why we do what we do anthrax is about putting it on and 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 it's catharsis and it's good for you and it's healthy and it's it's the exact opposite of everything that is on the front cover of the newspapers right now and man the reaction of that crowd of people who pretty much everyone uh, in the uh, Hammerstein ballroom that night, everyone had lost somebody. Everyone in that room had lost somebody in 9-11. The reaction we got from those people, from that crowd, and then being out in the, the lobby of the, of the venue and talking to all these firemen and policemen and families, mothers, daughters, sons, brothers, fathers of people, to the person, don't you fucking change your name, you know, you don't you fucking change your name for nothing. You know, you are fucking anthrax, you know, and then we're like, thank, thank you, thank you. That was the smallest part of that evening. I'm not trying to make that evening about us at, at all because we were there to entertain people who were in hell. And uh, I'm just glad we were able to, you know, give them an hour of maybe forgetting about reality for a minute and, uh, uh, you know, and Twisted Sister and Ace and Overkill. And, uh, it, it was an amazing, amazing night. I was impressed with them. I think there comes a time in your life, everyone asks themselves a question, do I want to continue on? No matter what ups and downs you have, and look, if we're being honest, anybody in Anthrax would admit there's been ups and there's been downs. There's been high points, there's been low points. That's only natural. It's going to happen with anybody in any walk of life for 40 years. They carried the Lamore ba banner in ways that most people don't understand what that meant to Brooklyn metalheads and metalheads in general in New York. They made some really great, consistently good records. No matter what was going on, they made some great records. They stayed 
true to themselves too. We always said, man, this is a big fucking boat to turn around, but we started to turn it around. And, and that's the moral of the story. You can turn that big boat around. Wake up on fire every day And I never say goodbye A lot of people called it our comeback. Mm.